There are things that are written, that are set in concrete, that is to say, immovable. And there are certain things that man can change. He cannot change that that is written, but he can change his own sentence or being in relationship to that that is said in concrete. I use that terminology and perhaps a little simpler than that that is written in the Greek, which means exactly that. There is one thing, our Father's Word, that shall not change. It is written, He has promised that we live by faith. He brought along schoolmasters. He brought along many things. Basically, overall, it bothers me a great deal that God's true word and the saying of our Savior, I come not to bring peace, but a sword, is a very painful thing, though I understand when we take it to the fullest. It sets brothers asunder against each other. It turns mother against daughter and father against son, or vice versa. The real truth. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling, and you can wrestle with it as you see families because of their beliefs in some, well, just almost fights at times. And I can remember back in the old days, my father and and uh, other men, when it almost ended up in that, you know, teaching and studying the good old word, or various beliefs within a family. And it is paramount when one accepts a, a belief or, or faith in something that everyone else must believe that way. So this leaves only one place we can go to grasp a better understanding of what our Father would have us understand from His teaching, His Word, to understand that even in that statement, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. Let's analyze it. If I've taught you to do any one thing, I hope that I have accomplished that. Come where? To this earth age. I came not to this earth age to bring peace, but a sword. Now, that does not stipulate what he shall return in the second advent to do. All right? We are people that can so easily pick up on something and it can have such a final ring to it, you know, because we are creatures of such a short span of thought and remembrance. That that it accomplishes overall in relationship to the saving of a soul, perhaps, is far more important than a little misunderstanding between souls on this earth today that the Word should be taught. My mind goes to another Greek word. Jesus said at one time, you know, it is written in the law that you shall not murder. And yet at the same time, he said, you are almost guilty of that if you call a man fool. And it's not the English word fool as, as we use the English word fool. It would do you all well to look it up for yourself sometime if you, if you ever have that thought in mind. But in a sense, in that word is the answer. For when you call a man this particular Greek word, I think our word moron comes from it, but let me just give you the definition, okay? It means you are calling a man totally void of any spiritual um, reality. That is to say, you don't even, that, that man doesn't even have a spirit, which means he doesn't have a soul. That's why Christ said, you're in danger of murder. Because you're talking about taking away the man's final chance at judgment. You're talking about not killing his flesh or murdering his flesh. When you use this word, you're talking about destroying his ultimate soul. And as it is written, 
Fear not he who can destroy your flesh, but your soul. That is to say, to cause it to perish. So, do you understand where I'm coming from here? We have to look at the overall picture, the overall plan of God, and thereby maybe it will give God's elect a little more patience when you're dealing with one of your loved ones that perhaps because and of in the name of religion can almost hate you or it can cause problems in a family. It is for that reason that we go to Galatians, the third chapter. Let's analyze our Father's Word a little bit with this thought in mind. Let's take first that that is unmovable, that that is set in concrete. Let's pick it up about 13. You're all familiar with these chapters. And you'll pick up on it. It is that promise that was made to Abraham. Made to Abraham long before the law was given. A promise. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And, of course, that comes from Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 21. The tree, of course, being the cross that Christ would hang on. First of all, or be crucified upon. First of all, understand this. The law is not bad. Never has been bad, and it never will be bad. It is man that is bad. The law is simply the set of rules that keep you out of trouble. If you could live without breaking one law, you would never have any problems, most likely. No serious problems anyway. But when where men congregate, there must always be law. It's foolish to think otherwise. Many of you will drive home. If it wasn't for that law, some of you would speed. All right? And... Go real fast, all right? But it keeps someone from... I mean, you just drive a little fast. Some people would drive 90 miles an hour and then screech the brakes and plow around one of these Arkansas curves and hopefully make it. You know. So we have to have laws or, or, or we could not be a civilized society, all right? It's got to be. Law is not bad. It's the man that breaks the laws that is bad and inasmuch as we are flesh, we're always going to fall short. And when we had to live by that law, it was we that were the curse or cursed by it to hell because we couldn't live by them. All right? I just want to set that straight. Now, 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That hope and promise. Take the, let's, just, let's just go all the way back. Sarah was 90 years old. Abraham was 100 years old. He, his will at that time was made out to, what was it, Eleazar, a servant. I think I may stand corrected on that. But a servant. He had no children, no offspring at that time, and, um, or up to that time. And then... God promised him that he would have many seed and also salvation to all of them and changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And even within that, Abraham, the father of many nations, nations meaning even the Gentiles, would be brought in through this promise of faith that he was willing after that conception in that dried womb, past bearing, to lay that child on an altar, believing God enough that if to raise the sword to, the, and kill the child at God's command, that God would raise him from dead, he would still come down off that mountain with him. He was willing to obey God because he obeyed God, documenting the fact that he did have faith that God knew what he was doing. It would seem in this day of time with a highly educated society that some think they know more than God. 
therefore they do not even exercise the education that they have to analyze and make a, a serious study of our Father's Word. Okay, verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. I'm talking like a man now and after their manner. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. If we go out here and we make a legal binding contract under law and sign it, we're not very well going to break that covenant. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to the seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And, of course, this was the overall. When, when Almighty God, Yahweh, ordered Abraham to the top of that mountain, and that child was on that altar with the wood, our father already knew it would be his son, Christ, that would be crucified. For it would be through that seed, that salvation, faith in God, knowing he was able, that would bring eternal life to the world. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before, the, uh, before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, Understand, the covenant that cannot be disannulled was made 430 years before the law even came into being. Before God struck on those tablets, that stone, the Ten Commandments, God knew what He was doing long before that. 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. That promise to Abraham concerning salvation, concerning the children of Israel, yes, his seed, all, as it is written in Romans 11, all Israel shall be saved. Not in this earth age, I guarantee you. It will be at the end of the millennium. But it opened it to all God's children that they could come under that promise when they exercise the faith within him. For if the inheritance be of the law, if that will that God made to Abraham that day, 430 years before the fact, if that will had been made, understand, think, think in a legal sense in as much as inheritance now, all right? Made a will to Abraham 430 years before, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise, not law. 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? Why, why do we really have it? Question. It was added because of transgressions. Now, I'm sorry about that, dear one. It was added because men needed it. Because they didn't know how to act or react. They didn't know how to control themselves. Therefore, it was necessary that speed laws came into existence. Now, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but please accept that. Now, I'm not being sacrilegious. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. He is our Father. Is the law then against the promise of God? Question. God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. It would have been if that were possible. Again, love and obedience can come only from within the heart of a free will soul. All right? But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise of faith, the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Romans 11:32. Always remember it. What a chapter in God's Word. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed, the coming of the Savior. 
In other words, when you broke a law, there was an escape valve there that it was not written that you were disinherited, period, unworthy. But an escape valve that when you turned in a different direction, which we call repentance, and you repented, though you fall short, you were placed back in that will. You were in totally good and right standing with our Father because of that Savior. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ that we might be justified by faith. There is nothing changed. Call it the law of liberty. The law still applies. Christ said, I come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. I do not change one jot or tittle. That means I don't even change the sound of one letter, much less a word, of that law. You're not going to keep them, though. You know that, and I know it. But we all try to do right, and when you try to do right, you're at least trying to obey the law. Do you understand where I'm coming from? The law is not bad. It is a. It should be a calendar on our wall, and I, I don't mean to literally put one on the, the wall of your mind, in the back of your mind, that when you break one of these, you get in trouble. Let's, let's just be silly a moment. Let's take the... Let's take the, well, let's take a severe one. That's not silly. Murder. It's a commandment. Well, it doesn't matter. The law's done away with. Well, go out and kill somebody and see what happens to you. Okay? It is an effect. Man's own more, I don't care if we're sinners, our moral fiber cries out at shed blood. So don't ever kid yourself that the law is of none effect. It's still there, very much there. It's in your own heart and soul, mind, body. Yet we all break them, but praise be to Christ. It is written and it is, un, it is immovable that on repentance that you're forgiven. That promise that was made even before the law cannot be changed because it is written, and praise God for that fact. But after that faith has come, verse 25, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. What, in, what creeps into our mind? It doesn't creep. It rushes in. That means the law is still there, but the love uh, for your fellow man, understanding, gushes in with the fact and the knowledge that Christ is Lord of all. His house is the house of prayer for all people. Everything in its right place and order. Room for all, plenty for all, all in all. There is one God. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You are of Him. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye all, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. That means the entire world is under that law, though it breaks that law tremendously. But there is coming a time when we go to the end of the trail. I call that the the end of the book of Revelation which describes of that time. Has anything changed? No, nothing has changed. You still, still see Israel within its walls. And what is this coming across the mountains? It is the nations, that is to say the Gentiles, coming with their own kings to worship God. Why? He created all beings. Everything in its time, everything in its place, all in Christ, forgiveness for all our sins. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That is a, that's a legal document. It's a legal document. It's a will left by one. And when Christ died, you can 
I mean, I, I don't like to use the word cash in on. You can collect on your part of that inheritance by claiming it. It is as sure as if we had it scrolled upon the wall that when he died, he was took on our curses. That is to say, those things that we have done that become a curse to us or will curse us. He took them upon himself and paid the price. You might say to make valid in advance. Listen to my words. To make valid in advance. It's really the best way you can say it. That when you sin, when you fall short of that law, and you're going to, I'm going to, we all do, we all have in the past, and I don't see anything as long as we're in the flesh that's going to change that a great deal. When you accept Christ and you still continue to sin and you have to call out on repentance, it's, it's status quo. Now, I'm not, I don't want to take, I'm not taking anything away from Christ. I'm just saying look at man as we are. Don't try to be a dreamer out in some boom-boom land. He paid the price, and except you believe upon Him and accept that will, your inheritance, you're not going to make it. You're going to have much trouble. And the more, when you fall then back under the law, the more of those laws you break, the more trouble you got, friend. Families can absolutely be eaten up. I mean, eaten up by transgressions against God's law. Well, how can that be? Well, within their homes, they have the spirit of argument. They have the spirit of strife. Within their own home, they have the spirit of um, doubt. And God forbid, but the spirit of jealousy... And on and on we could go, well, those are just little things. Oh, are they really as they act as a cancer in your home and literally destroy you? Because you're transgressing the natural order of things. When if you just turn loose a minute and relax in Him, let His love flow. And understand that all these things are of Satan. And my sweet little Christian home is not as Christian as I thought it was when I allow things that are satanic. Well, they don't seem to be a tonic, a satanic. Well, my dear friend, try it without those things sometimes. Repent. <coughs> Cleanse. Start over. Love each other. In the love of Christ. And let that love be upon your family. Then you're cooking. Then you are living today in the will that has your name on it. Yours to receive. Now, we have many other things that enter into this. Let that be for our immediate family. All right? I'm talking about our our homes, all right, man, wife, children. Let's go now. Let's expand this one step, and let's go to our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, aunts, uncles, and so forth. And let's go to a, a different turn of events of what man can do to himself through Satan's very disguised... Religion, playing religion, we call it deception, they call it church. Strong words, well, turn with me to Mark chapter 7. It would seem that people enjoy... Deceiving themselves of saying, isn't it wonderful when they're kind of covering things over and it's so much better to be honest with yourself 
and with our Father in relationship to His Word. What about religious uh, houses, religious social systems? By that I mean a group of people that strike a covenant of their own saying, we're going to call this church the church next door. A new denomination brought forth and struck. What a wonderful name. The little church next door. All right? Now, it doesn't really... And let me make it very clear. I'm not knocking churches, but this is a real world, and Christianity is a reality. All right? Just because it's called the little church next door does not necessarily mean that it's a church under Christ's word, under the will, and under the law. And please don't say, I teach law, that I'm a legalist. I'm, you know better than that, or you haven't understood anything I've said up to this point. It's only a gauge to go by to keep you out of trouble. Let's see what this does to a community. Mark chapter 7, verse 1, Then came together unto him the Pharisees. One of the uh, one of the highest religious groups of that time. I mean, talk about the little church next door. This was it, friend. And certain of the scribes. Ooh, this is the keeper of the scriptures themselves, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, underletted defiled. That is to say, with unwashing hands, they found fault. Now, a wise person stops and says, what? Let's see, which commandment is that? What, what commandment is it this little church next door has here? We're supposed to and you got to understand, this is not just, I'll run it to sink. I'll be there in a minute, honey. i got to wash my hands. Well, that's not what we're talking about, all right? This was a, this was, I mean, if you didn't wash them all the way to the elbow and sprinkle them and go around three times, glory, 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 ooh, ritual, see, a religious ceremonial washing, not just washing the dirt off your hands before you eat. But find that in God's Word for me. And let me save you some time. It isn't there. This was a rule brought forward by the little church next door. Sound harmless enough to you, right? Well, if the little church next door wants to do that, how can that have any effect between them and Christ? Well, let's find out. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except, ex, except they, wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. The little church next door holds the traditions of elders. Now, there's where you want to start getting suspicious, right there. What elders? Because the little church next door should be holding the traditions of Almighty God. You understand that? That's where the difference comes in. They should be holding the traditions of Almighty God. And when they come from the market, except they wash. This was a baptismal, is the word in the Greek. Ceremonial washing. They eat not, and many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. I mean, if it isn't done just in a certain way, that it has the seal of the approval of the little church next door, it's not clean. You understand? Now, let's think a moment. The little church, and, and so help me God, I'm, not going, I'm just going to pick a few of the things, all right, that we deem 
that we practice today in some churches next door. In our church next door, I just received a message from them. We cannot approach God because we have an organ and a piano right up here in the front, like this was a honky-tonk, all right? And we have musicians in this house. They're all right, you know, as long as they sing without the honky-tonk music and the... And the now, that's the way they would pass it off, okay? You can't have musical instruments in your church. According to who? Well, according to that little church next door. All right? And then there's a little church next door here that as long as you come there, Christ... The little church next door, if you're divorced, so help you God. You are a marked person in the little church next door. All right? You understand? Friend, you haven't got a prayer according to the little church next door. Doesn't that sound religious? Hmm? I heard the preacher say it. That I heard that man of God say it. Did you hear about what happened or the law of the little church next door? Well, that's not in God's Word either. It says in my Word, Christ said, if you don't repent and you sinned and you ran out on the old lady and so on and so forth and one thing and the other, that she's got a right to boot you out. But He also says if that scoundrel, that no good comes to the light, and there is a total change, that he's a new being, and that if he meets another person that is totally a new being and has come to the light, then to not accept that fact is blasphemy, but not according to the little church next door. All right? How wonderful religion is when we listen to it and when we go to that little altar and when we bow to it and when we accept the things that it brings forth that are so wonderful to the community and man. you know, Well, so much for the little church next door for a moment, all right? We could go on and on, all right? They even sometimes roll Easter eggs. You know, and we won't even go into that, all right? That's a heathenistic fertility rite that they do on Passover in, mem in memorial of Christ shedding His blood on the cross. And even bring in the little church next door. Did you see the beautiful little Easter bunnies? It comes from the old saying, just say it like it is, quick like a rabbit, friend. Another heathen ritual uh, enough, all right? But that's the little church next door. It's very, very, very religious. All right. Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, speaking to Jesus, Why walk not thy disciples according to the traditions of the elders? Here they have the Son of God before them, not saying, Why don't they walk after the traditions of Almighty God, but have the audacity? to ask why don't they do as our elders, the elders of the little church next door, but eat bread with unwashed hands. And he answered and said unto them, Well hath Esaias, or this is to say Isaiah the prophesied of you hypocrites. He was a very direct type person, our Savior was. These were the pastors of the little church next door. He called them hypocrites. As it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You see, God said none of those things, nor did God harness His people with any of those false and fake laws. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines 
the commandments of men, not the commandments of God. Wake up to the little church next door, dear one. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. It's silly, childish, and hypocritical. And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. That's what they want to do. They want to keep the elders' tradition, not the commandments or the law of Almighty God. For Moses said, this is the law, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. That's a commandment. But ye say, according to your traditions, ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban. It's a religious gift for the little church next door. Let the old... Let the old lady starve. This is a gift for the church, little church next door. That is to say, a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. In other words, give it all to the church and let her starve. Don't worry, she'll be free. All right? Ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father and his mother. Your little traditions of the church next door cause that person to break the commandments of God and ignore their mother and father, making the word of God of none effect, disannulled through your traditions which ye have delivered, and many such like things do you. That's only one, he said. Many like things ye do in that little church next door. We have come to the place in this time and this age where this continues on, whereby certain... Members of families join this particular denomination or that particular denomination. Mom and dad, because of their wisdom, and sometimes it's the other way around. It's the child, because of their innocence, hears truth, God's Word, God's law, not traditions of the little church next door. And they see the beauty and the wealth of the inheritance and the peace of mind that can be inherited now. And they step aside, and they go to that. That let, let's take it in the same line that Christ did, so it's a little we're a little better able to follow it. This mother and this dad, after having studied so many years, finally come to the truth, and encouraging their own children to join this little church next door. Wanting, you know, you want the best for your kids, right? You want them in Sunday school. I mean, what? After all, the neighbors will say, "Oh, they're they're good. They're church people." Yeah, they're church people. It doesn't matter whether they're Christian or whatever. You know, they are little church people next door. All right? And But you come to the solid truth, and you say, little ones, listen to me. And you say, do you know what really happened in the garden? <gasps> Did you know what my mother said? You know what my father said? You'll never believe. They don't believe that Eve ate an apple in the... My mother doesn't believe that Eve ate an apple in the garden. And the little church next door teaches us that from Sunday school up. That mothers love apples. Or something like that, all right? <clears throat> the sad part is... That son and daughter will turn on that mother and father and say, you're trying to join a cult. They dishonor their mother and father over the little church next door. They break the law of God. 
And this word then splits a family in two. You do not, if your entire family, I, I look at the day family and I marvel, you know, that God should have put so many souls in one nest, all right, that would come into the truth, you know. It didn't happen that way in my family. But, and I don't have to look too far to see other examples. You know what I mean. But there it is. The truth, then we hear those words of Jesus ring out. I come not to bring peace, but a sword among families. It is written in another place in the Old Testament. There will come a time when you'd better not even share your inner thoughts with she that shares your pillow. Meaning that there would be different thoughts, different religions, traditions that make void. But let me assure you of one thing. It is not, just in case you should misread that, it is not the word itself that is disannulled. It is that the little church next door caused their people to act in such a way that ignorantly they fall so far away from God's traditions that they don't even recognize the fact that they are in need of repentance. Wherein have we robbed him? You see, they, they're, they're doing all right. They're in good standing with the little church next door. But people will turn against their own parents. And this has always bothered me when I see that something as beautiful as God's Word could, as a teacher, if, after having shared it, could cause problems in a family. How can, how can His Word and the, the truth that does bring peace of mind, how can something so beautiful cause upset? And then we must stop for a moment and realize that God overall is in control. That He knows what He's doing. He is a God of love. It is better that you have a little discomfort now and in the millennium, when everyone comes to full remembrance, it is at that time that you can see that love flow forth. For in closing, let us follow through on this and grasp just a little bit of that overall picture. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 44. Those chapters that pertain to the millennium, Follow me, you're already in the millennium. Christ has returned the second time. He is talking here to the Zadok, the priesthood of the Zadok, which is Zadok in the Hebrew tongue means the upright, God's elect, uh, those that have overcome. And they are the only people that will be able to approach Christ through the millennium. This mother and this daughter or this brother that you so dearly love that will not listen to God's Word or that would be angry at you for teachings from the Word or believing from the traditions of God rather than men, you will have this opportunity. It is one of probably one of the greatest gifts God could give us because in that millennium you're going to have power and authority. And some loved one of yours that might have already passed on, that in your mind, of course, you wouldn't be the type of person that would judge someone, but you might think in your mind they were dead and in hell, or doomed for hell, that is to say. It's not our right to judge. But let's say that be the case, that your loved one, when they got to the throne, they were joyful when they seen the Father, and then their head hung because they know that they, they knew at that moment they hadn't overcome, so they take this position in paradise that is called the other side. And they're very sad there. But they have one hope. That they will receive the truth, but they also have someone that loves them very much. One of God's elect. What makes the difference? 
God's elect, Ezekiel 44, verse 24. In controversy, they shall, they being God's elect, the just, those that will stand by faith, shall stand in judgment, and they shall judge it according to my judgments. Why? They're the true children of God. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes and all mine assemblies, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths, my rests, that is to say. And they shall come at no dead person. Now, wait a minute. Don't, don't read over that. We're in the millennium, and there is no flesh. This means, of course, those that did not overcome, the sinners, those that could not, through faith, believe upon God's Word, but rather stuck to the traditions of men. They are called dead. Why? They still have mortal souls. Mortal in the Greek word meaning, is a Greek word meaning liable to die. Therefore, they are called dead because they didn't overcome. You cannot go to them to defile themselves, but this is, this is a big one here. All right? Think about it. For father or for mother or for son or for daughter or brother or for sister, that hath had no husband, they may defile themselves. Why? What does that mean? It means that if you see maybe your old dad that's already gone, and he was a hell raiser right here on earth, and we're not to judge anyone as to whether they're good or bad. I'm just using an analogy, all right? This has an analogy. Maybe he never had an opportunity to really know the truth, and he was wise enough to know that the little church next door sure wasn't for him. There were a bunch of play actors there. But in the millennium, you're going to go to him, and you're going to be able to put your arms around him. And you're going to be able to say, Dad, I think you're not taking this serious enough. Oh, Father of mine, this is the millennium, and you're in a spirit body now, and you're going to... Your soul has not overcome, and you're going to lose it if you don't get your act together. You've got to do this, that, or the other, and I want you to make it because I don't want to go through eternity without you. I want you with me. I want you to make it because God loves you, and He has given us this opportunity. Or you can go to that little mother, or that brother, or that sister, and I am not too sure that the brother and sister here does not necessarily is, has its limits to blood only. I think it might mean some of our other special brothers and sisters also that we knew had good qualities, that were outstanding, that you're going to pay a penalty for this. You understand what I'm saying? You're going to pay a penalty for going to them, but you can do it. You can reach out. So when you find yourself growing angry at one of your loved ones, no one understand that you still have this opportunity to touch them. And that this is the time that really counts, I mean the millennium, before that great judgment day of the Lord. And know that Father knows best. Our Heavenly Father knows best. Therefore, in His appointed time, not ours. What is the penalty we pay? And after He is... I'm sorry. Uh, they may defile themselves. And after He is cleansed, they shall reckon unto Him seven days. You're going to have to stay out of Christ's presence seven days. And in that day that He goeth into the sanctuary, unto the inner court, to minister in the sanctuary, He shall offer His sin offering, saith the Lord God. Sin offering is love, your love for Christ, that you so loved your old dad or your old mom or your brother or your sister, that it was that love that caused you to do this. And in his love, in returning that love for the fact that this would make a good member for the eternity, a citizen of heavenly places, and it shall be unto them for an inheritance. Do you understand legal terms again? It's your 
yours to claim. It's yours to know. It's knowledge for you to have. You can claim it. It's legally guaranteed by your father, in other words. I am their inheritance, and ye shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. What a beautiful truth that God is your possession. Because he loves you so much. He did not disown you because in the millennium you loved your old dad or mom or brother or sister so much that you went there and said, listen to me. I love you. I want you to understand and to assist them, to help them, and to love them. So do not think that all, do I dare say all the eggs are in one basket after what we said earlier? Well, figure of speech, all right? That God does not consider this little old earth age everything. And that in serving Him, He has servants that are special to Him in all ages, especially those that overcome in the first earth age. So, when I was a child, I spake as a child. And when I grew to maturity in my Father's Word, I tried to possess more understanding and love to reach out and to have patience with those that don't know, those that are too steeped in the church, little church next door, and yes, even to better understand the little church next door, and to know, but by the grace of God, there go I. So, serve Him, love Him, thank Him. It is a special people indeed that God opens their minds to His in-depth truth and uses them to accomplish His loving, caring, concerning overall plan. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Father, for Your Word, for Your truth. And Father, as we try to understand even Thy emotions, those things that Thou would have us do, and to give Thee pleasure, we thank You, Father, for this present, this pleasant, wonderful heritage of being able to help, yes, even in that time. We thank you for that in Jesus' precious name. Amen.